Should US multinationals be restructuring their debt in reaction to the COVID-19 crisis? And if so, how, how should they do it? To find out more, stay tuned to this seventh episode of IBFD's Tax Takes videos on the global in tax implications of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be focusing on group financing um, and a particular focus on U.S. multinationals. I'm Barry Larkin, and I'm very happy to have with me today Mike Lebovich, a U.S. partner at global law firm Mayer Brown. Mike's also a frequent speaker um, at IBFD's conferences and courses, so many of you will already be uh, familiar with him. If you're not, check out his bio on the IBFD's web pages. Right, M Mike, uh, let's get started. Why are U.S. multinationals looking at their debt arrangements and what are their options? Uh, thanks, Barry. It's nice to be back speaking for IBFD again. The multinational, U.S. multinationals in particular are focusing on intercompany debt in part to alleviate sort of cash flow concerns of their of their subsidiaries. One way to, you know, to mitigate you know, mitigate cash flow crises is to adjust, um, it, make changes to their intercompany debt structure, you know, changing interest rates, um, forgiving debt, um, making some uh, making some other changes. And so there are intercompany debt is just sort of one tool to help deal with uh, cash flow concerns at the subsidiary level. Right. OK. Uh, is it just cash flow or are we also looking at tax deductibility? Uh, you're looking at you're looking at both, um, but you know uh, at, as you know we may touch on in a bit. You know, inter, um, deductibility is heavily dependent on on profitability, and right now, given the pressure on profitability, you know, deductibility is is going to be is going to be you know limited as well. And so, I think the focus, while deductibility is important, I think a real a more critical issue is cash flow. OK, and, and if we're talking about foreign subsidiaries, are we just talking about foreign tax deductibility or is there something else? Uh, it's it's both. You are definitely the first lot. First issue, of course, is deductibility and, you know, tax consequences from a foreign law standpoint. But because of the pervasive reach of our controlled foreign corporation regime, any time that there is some kind of an impact at a, at a foreign subsidiary level, that can give rise to income inclusions, in particular under our, our, our new guilty regime. So anytime that there is an income inclusion, you know, even if there isn't an income inclusion from a foreign law standpoint, there can be an income inclusion from a U.S. standpoint that would trigger a, a guilty pickup in the, in the U.S. OK, so I guess yeah, the message here is that it's not just a question of foreign tax or U.S. tax, is we have to look at both. Exactly. And oftentimes the U.S. rules, just because of the pervasive nature of our CFC regime, oftentimes our U.S. rules, you know, you know, supersede or, or sort of overwhelm the foreign tax consequences. Right. OK, well, that wouldn't be the first time um, <laughs> uh, in terms of doing something about it, solving the problem. Uh, you know, again, what are the options available? What are the tax consequences uh, of exercising those options? Sure. So there's really there's really two approaches. Approach number one is making changes to the debt itself, you know, making changes to the to the to the loan, changing payment terms, changing interest rates, making some other other changes that would help from a cash flow standpoint of the of the subsidiary. That's that's one option. Option number two is simply to capitalize the, the debt contribute the debt and you know any accrued interest to the capital of the subsidiary so you're basically converting the debt into into equity you're obviously foregoing you know future deductibility future you know the ability to repatriate through repayment of debt but that is a you know that that is an option but that's better than getting um a, a no deduction uh, today and a pickup uh, also today in the in the hands of the U.S. creditor. So right, because the thing that right, because the thing we're, we're mainly focused on when we're modifying a debt instrument is triggering cancellation of indebtedness income at the subsidiary level that can create tax consequences from a foreign law standpoint and from a U.S. U.S. Ta tax yeah. standpoint. Um, and so if you make anything other if you make any kind of significant modification to a debt instrument, 
that will be treated as a sale or exchange of that in debt instrument and will give and could give rise to cancellation of indebtedness income. Right. So and even if it didn't in the it, it, it give rise to to cancellation of debt, indebtedness income in the under the foreign tax jurisdiction, correct. it might give a U.S. Uh, at, equipment. At, yeah. Absolutely. And that's that that's a, a quite frequent occurrence because any kind of even any kind of modification to the interest rate, unless it's, you know, very minor, um, you know, 0.25% on the rate or uh, a change in just 5.5% 5, 5, 5 of the yield will trigger a significant modification and that will then trigger all of our all of our rules. And under, you know, under the rules in many foreign countries, an interest rate change of that, you know, of, of, of that amount wouldn't generally give rise to a sale or exchange. Right. So, I mean, it may. Yeah. So in that sense, it from a uh, from, from a U.S. perspective, it may not even uh, make any difference whether you modif made a small modification or actually canceled the, uh, the, the debt or. or Correct. Correct. Yeah. So you can generally, you know, you you can generally roll over the um, the debt and the accrued interest into a new note um, with a reduced interest rate as long as you've rolled over everything, you know, the debt and the accrued interest. And that won't give rise to cancellation of indebtedness. OK, income. so that's a solution for the from the on the U.S. side. And then we just have to sort of check that 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 would also correct. be OK from the foreign tax side. And, and certainly my, my experience on the the the, the foreign the non-U.S. tax side is that the rules are incredibly complex and they differ from every country so absolutely now you can you can contribute you can capitalize the debt um you can capitalize the debt um and um and capitalize the accrued interest and in general that won't create capitalization or that won't create create cancellation of indebtedness income one consequence though is that if you capitalize the accrued interest you may not create cancellation of indebtedness income, but the capitalization of itself is treated as a payment of that interest and could give rise to withholding tax. And so that's a, you know, that's certainly the position of the IRS. That's that's how, you know, a capitalization of accrued interest would be treated as a, a payment of interest for withholding tax purposes in many, in many other countries as well. And so that's something to be be mindful of. Yeah, looking at the COVID-19 crisis and the measures that have been taken by very by, by governments to to relieve the consequences. Uh, I know that the US has has had a whole bunch of uh, of measures that they've introduced to do this. And some of these are particularly relevant to what we're looking at now. Um, the 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 measures introduced under the CARES Act. Could you just m maybe say a couple of words on their relevance? Sure. So, um we um we made changes to our our interest deductibility limitations following the the BEPS recommendations. So we, like many countries, now have a a thirty percent EBITDA limitation on interest deductibility. Right, the same, done, the same as as, our, as in the EU under the the ATAD, of course. Yeah, correct, correct. Um, and so we've we've made two changes. One is for 2019 and 2020, we've raised that threshold to 50% of EBITDA. So okay. as EBITDA is, is reduced, there is still the possibility of, of some deduction for interest expense. But as we said at the outset, in order to deduct interest, you got to have some EBITDA. Yeah, and so if you go, a, if lot you're of making a lot of subsidiaries down. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's not really very helpful what they've done. Or, I mean, uh, you know. It's, it's 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 nice, but I've you know, and it's it's helped in you know I've, we've had client scenarios where it's helped a, a bit. The other thing that's also helpful is that we we've allowed taxpayers in 2020 to use their 2019 EBITDA threshold, um, and so in theory, prior to the outbreak of the the crisis, you know, 2019 EBITDA you know is probably higher than 2020 EBITDA. So that's another that's another change. Right, but, but that's that simply increases the amount of deduct potentially deductible interest. But again, if you, if your revenue is zero in in twenty twenty, exactly. then again, it's of no no benefit. Or can you do something with it? I mean, can you carry forward? Can you can you, you carry can, back? You can carry forward the limitation, but again, 
you know, I, I we see multinationals trying to make more medium term changes here, and that's why they would sort of get to, you know, look at things like reducing reducing the interest rate to actually smooth out the potential deductibility over the over the medium term. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's more focus on the restructuring rather than uh, taking uh, advantage of the increased deductibility that you know you theoretically have. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 helpful, but I think multinationals are looking at profitability, the impact of profitability over the next three to five years, and so making some changes now that you know put them in a position to deal with this over the next over the medium term is probably yeah. more appropriate. Yeah, it, it just if we're talking about those deduction deduction limitations, um, the thirty percent or fifty percent uh, uh, limitation uh, in the EU under the ATAD, they had a, a grandfathering for existing right. loans, so, so they were taken out of the computation. Um, is there something similar in the US um, that, that, yeah, that may help? If, if there if rules applied to a debt instrument. And you have a significant modification of that it, that it debt instrument. That it debt instrument is now a new debt instrument, and so whatever rules are apply now, apply as if it's a new a new debt instrument. Right. So in that yeah. sense, we have sort of a correlation between the U.S. and the foreign, or at least the EU rules, because they also have a similar uh, rule that says if you modify the uh, the debt, then it's no longer grandfathered. Interestingly, yeah, I, would, I, I guess the point I would the point I would make there is that. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot easier to trip a significant modification in the U.S. than it is in 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 Europe. Right. So, well, well, that may or may not be the case. I mean, the, the the problem with the EU rules is that they they are very sort of generic. There's there isn't much detail. So you know exactly how different member states are going to apply them remains to be seen. Um, I was going to going to mention uh, Belgium in this context, which which only a few days ago. Uh, uh, announced that it would be allowing grandfathering to continue uh, where there was a modification of a, of a debt instrument, so long as that was the result of a, a COVID-19 um, uh, response. So uh, maybe yeah. other mem member states or other countries, uh, maybe the US will also uh, follow suit. Well, yeah, well, well it, that's been suggested. Um, you know, we'll, it's, it's easier, it's easy enough, I think, to avoid the the consequences of ca cancellation of indebtedness income that remains to be seen in the in the U.S. Okay, well, look, Mike, I think we've uh, come to the end of, of uh, this short discussion on an incredibly complex topic. Uh, what would be your kind of main uh, takeaway, main main point of attention for multinationals which are looking at their debt uh, arrangements at the moment? Well, first of all, as as just this fifteen minutes has has illustrated, these rules are incredibly complex, and you need to you know, look at both the U.S. and the foreign, the U.S. and the non-U.S. side as, as well and make sure you're overlaying the two. Um, but secondly, and I think probably more significantly, is that intercompany debt is really just one tool in, in the multinationals arsenal here. And as you're looking at trying to improve cash flow, improve profitability, Intercompany debt is one tool, but you should be looking at supply chain, distribution, et cetera. And, and, and in a sense, look at this from a holistic standpoint and look at all of the intercompany arrangements and see where you have the mo where you can be the most effective um, in improving, improving cash flow, because it's not just intercompany debt. You could be looking at transfer pricing, distribution models, et, et cetera. So okay. my advice would be take a holistic approach. Yeah, so no tunnel vision, um, but um, look at the big picture. Well, look, Mike, thanks very much once again for giving us uh, the benefit of your insights into this, uh, yeah. this area. And um, thank you very much to our viewers for tuning in. Uh, if you want to see more uh, videos in this series, then check out the IBFD's Tax Takes uh, web pages. And with that, again, thank you, um, Mike, and thank you to our viewers. Thank you.